so uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, calling in from Ottawa, Canada, which is uh, same sort of time zone as Montreal and Toronto for anyone who's familiar with uh, with Canada. And uh, it's one of the, I guess it's the fourth or fifth largest city in, in Canada um, and is the, the capital of Canada, but not, not the largest city by any means. Um, I am the uh, director um, uh, here at the Ottawa Integrative uh, Cancer Centre and also for the, uh, the Department of Research and Clinical Epidemiology at the Naturopathic College in Toronto. Um, and I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, the OICC, the Ottawa Integrative Cancer Centre, and uh, its creation um, and some of the research that we're doing and some of the patients that we're seeing and hopefully uh, stimulate some thought and, and discussion around that. So uh, just uh, as an outline, we'll be reviewing um, integrative oncology very briefly in the OICC, uh, talking about uh, the feasibility to implementation for the, uh, the center here, uh, including the model of care that we apply for our patients, a little bit of our, our patients, uh, the kinds of people that we see, and, uh, um, and the, uh, the, the issues that they're dealing with. And then I'll talk about two of the major uh, research studies that we have ongoing here. Uh, and then finally, talk a little bit about some of the lessons that, um, that I've learned in the process of developing this center and reaching out and collaborating, if you will, with, uh, with um, oncology colleagues at the hospital and in the community. So I think we all understand that uh, cancer is a uh, has rapidly become one of the biggest killers uh, in the world. Globally, in fact, is probably the biggest now. In Canada, it is the number one disease um, responsible for mortality. And uh, this is actually, these are <laughs> the newer stats for 2017, which I haven't put in yet, um, actually show an increased uh, level, uh, more like one in two people will develop cancer in their lifetime. So it's a, it's a huge um, issue and uh, more than a quarter of people will, will actually die from the disease. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest uh, from the WHO and uh, for, you know, from a lot of observational studies that cancer is a preventable disease. It's a chronic disease uh, that um, doesn't have to be uh, uh, as prevalent as it is now. So I think there are great opportunities for changing the trajectory for this disease. Um, obviously, an aging population will see increasing rates of cancer as that uh, develops. So just before I get into um, more of the presentation here, the, I'd like to define some terms. Uh, complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, as it's more commonly known, is an umbrella term that is used to define all of everything that is incorporated within um, complementary medicine. So that could be from prayer all the way to a very uh, alternative, aggressive uh, treatment that is uh, using in, in injectable therapies, but not done in the hospital. So it's a huge range of different therapies that are uh, within the CAM umbrella. Um, and I think really important to consider that when we're looking at different components, not to lump everything together, but to look at specific parts of complementary medicine to see what is useful and what may not be useful. And that's something that we're really engaged with. Alternative medicine is more in opposition to uh, or instead of conventional medicine, uh, whereas complementary is usually in addition to and alongside conventional medicine. And that's normally how people are using it or as an alternative. And then there's integrative medicine, which is really um, where the therapy and the approach is done in collaboration with conventional medicine and not in opposition. But there's communication, there's dialogue, there is a working together, if you will, with the patient at the center to try to bring that uh, uh, care forward. Um, so I think in terms of where we get our information on complementary and alternative medicine, it's important to think about this. Many times it's at health food stores. So the uh, a clerk uh, at a health food store might make suggestions for therapies. There may be things in the internet uh, that are very uh, sensationalized about different complementary medicines to try to sell things, sell ideas or sell products. Um, and uh, 
there's questionable there. We have certain shows. Uh, this one is from the States, the Dr. Oz show. Do you know, are you familiar with uh, the Oz show? Um, anyways, this is one that's, uh, you know, a lot of people get their information from on TV. And of course, there is uh, internet searches as well. How much of this is good information? How much is misinformation? I think is a, a very um, important question and uh, one that uh, our patients struggle with all the time. Uh, I think consequences of some of this misinformation is that patients may refuse uh, what could be curative conventional treatment like surgery for early stage disease, for example. Uh, they may have a belief that this is harmful or that there are natural cures that are available and therefore avoid conventional medicine. And so this is a, uh, a problem of misinformation. They can incur costs associated with this and they may take agents that may say not safely uh, interact with conventional treatments um, and have their own side effects as well. Um, there is the stress and the anxiety around having too much information that is not good and conflicting information. We deal with this all the time in uh, integrative oncology. And then when the communication around this kind of care is not good with the physicians at the hospital, it can create a dysfunction in that therapeutic relationship. And then you get um, patients that are doing things on their own without any communication. So really, um, drives the idea that an integrative approach uh, is very supportive for the patients as much as possible. And this is the inclusion of evidence informed, not absolutely strictly based, <laughs> but um, informed uh, by the evidence uh, for complementary medicine alongside uh, and ideally integrated with conventional care. And there's an emphasis on a whole person approach where the pathophysiology of the disease uh, is important, but it's not, it's one component. So we look also at the mental emotional health of the person, where their spirit is and, and how they are coping with the, the disease and how they're every, you know, all the different uh, side effects that they may be dealing with. So really trying to do, provide patient-centered care that is individualized to their needs and that incorporates um, a more of a holistic approach to care. Um, these are some uh, just logos for different uh, interesting um, and important, I would say, groups that are working on integrative oncology. There's the Society for Integrative Oncology. They have a conference that's going to be happening, their 14th conference this uh, November in Chicago. And that is a very multidisciplinary collaborative group that has oncologists, uh, nurses, naturopathic doctors, patient advocates that go there and um, really they're developing the evidence around this. So if you're interested in this area, I would highly recommend the SIO. Uh, the Oncology Association of, of uh, Naturopathic Physicians is a group dedicated to naturopathic oncology. Uh, and uh, then there's the OICC, which I slipped in there. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, the Knowledge in Naturopathic Oncology website, which is trying to help develop some of the evidence around that as well. So I think the, the need for this is really driven by patients. They want to see this kind of care. And um, there is a huge, uh, there is a, a majority of patients that are using complementary medicine and they want to do so in a way that's safe and, and informed and, uh, and collaborative as well. And um, really there's a lot of research needs that we need to, to build on uh, for integrative oncology that looks at the impact of care, its efficacy, its safety, and also at the cost effectiveness of, of, the, uh, uh, of this um, application. There are lots of opportunities, uh, I would say, uh, both from the research and from uh, being a clinician to support patients. Uh, there's no question that this kind of care has an impact on quality of life. Uh, we see it every day and uh, managing symptoms. Uh, and a lot of it's about empowerment for the patient, but giving them tools for themselves. There's some potential for extension of life that uh, has been shown with certain therapies that we want to we need to uh, build on the evidence around that, but there is some compelling uh, early data that yes, indeed, integrative care can help uh, prolong uh, life. Um, really uh, assisting in their decision-making process is, is um, essential and uh, helping them to navigate between good information, bad information, and what they can be incorporating uh, safely. 
uh, and then also to help them to tolerate and to go through conventional care more effectively is some of the uh, is one of the benefits uh, as well. We look at uh, supporting and strengthening the body's internal defenses, and as mentioned before, educating and empowering patients. So the vision for the OICC was really to create a sustainable center dedicated to providing and researching integrative and preventative cancer care that would lead to the creation of other similar centers as well. And our measures of success is really to see from the patients how well that's happening and to conduct the research um, that's necessary to document that. I, I won't go through this whole slide. You can find it on the website if you'd like, but um, really it's about a whole person care, our ends to bridge between complementary and conventional medicine, to um, provide evidence-informed resources, to do research, uh, to address some of the environmental contributors to cancer, and to be a resource for training um, and education in integrative oncology. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is one of the reasons I am so delighted to speak to folks in Brazil. It's wonderful. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. Um, so yeah, we've been there. I'm going backwards here. Uh, the pillars of care for the OICC is really um, we want to focus on healthy nutrition, uh, healthy movement, exercise, and fitness, which is an extremely evidence-based uh, approach to, to cancer care and prevention. So we help to coach people to become uh, more fit to adopt this uh, exercise into their life. And that's a, a very important. We look at helping their uh, mind, body, and spirit, the whole package. We look at maybe shifting the environment that they live in, whether it's social environment that creates stress or it's, um, uh, you know, too much uh, consumption of, of, uh, of uh, uh, plastic in the microwaves and the things that may be contributing from an environmental standpoint to progression as well, although we have limited information on that. And then healthy physiology. How do we help support the immune system to be active against the cancer? How do we help to reduce inflammation in the body? How do we help to change metabolism perhaps that so, so that the cancer is less able to grow in, 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 in an organism? Um, very quickly in terms of funding, people are often wondering how we uh, are supporting ourselves. We have had seed and operational support. Uh, we are covered by fee for services, both through uh, government covered uh, services through the medical doctors that work here, and then also for fee for service by the um, uh, by the patients, and then also from some of the programming that we have. Uh, we have research support that helps that staff and infrastructure, and then we have uh, developed a foundation to, for philanthropic support to uh, expand on our care to people who can't afford this, uh, and to expand on the research and the program. Uh, so I won't uh, do spend very much time on the feasibility study, but just to say that six years ago, or actually, uh, I guess eight years ago now, we started a feasibility study to look at how could we create this. And the components of the feasibility study were to, one, do a systematic review of the literature to look at uh, what has been accomplished in other countries in terms of integrative oncology and centers for integrative uh, medicine in, in cancer care. And so we did that. Um, we then also did a, a qualitative analysis uh, and study with patients locally and with physicians um, in the hospital, oncologists and uh, surgeons. And then we spoke to uh, complementary and alternative medicine practitioners as well to try to get a sense of what could we achieve here and how well could we do that. And then we went to visit some of the different centers across North America uh, to uh, understand better what they do. So the first, uh, we published on, uh, on these uh, findings as well, and, and um, those are, are, are available, uh, I think mostly in Current Oncology is the journal that we've published in. Uh, the, um, so uh, this is part of the systematic review. We did a standard process for extraction and screening of uh, a number of articles. Uh, and then we looked at a number of data points uh, for what um, were important to help us guide us in terms of that. So it was like you know, the article, the clinic, the components of care, the organizational structure, and how the patient interacted with the clinic and were there any measurable outcomes uh, followed. So we did find many examples. Um, uh, of centers, over 20, 
um, most of which were in the States uh, and in Europe and in, in the UK, in fact, uh, with only two examples in Canada. And I don't think we found one um, in, at the time in Brazil that reported. That doesn't mean there isn't any that exist there, but there was no reporting on that in the literature, at least in, in terms of our inclusion criteria. The, um, so it was interesting, lots of variation, but it certainly helped us. Um, so that is, as mentioned, published in Current Oncology in 2012, and which is an open access journal if anyone's interested in that. The, um, the next part was a qualitative study. So we assessed the needs and perspectives of cancer patients, their caregivers and healthcare providers. Um, we looked at potential models for collaboration and uh, how would patients flow through the center and then some of the outcomes that we could look at to evaluate. And then we looked at what were some of the perceived barriers or facilitators to trying to create this kind of a, um, a, a model in, in, in Ottawa. So we looked at, we did um, reviews with, uh, uh, interviews with for about an hour, uh, roughly with these different practitioners and family members and patients. You can see the breakdown as far as the types of uh, of uh, participants, uh, we had 39 that were interviewed. And this was done by a qualitative researcher to code the information in a way that was had some rigor according to qualitative research methodology. Um, so the five major categories that we came up with as sort of thematic groupings were related to the model of care, the physical setup, the values inherent to a center like this, how to evaluate the impact of uh, of, um, of the care in the, in the space, and then what were the facilitators and barriers as well. So I, I think it's interesting to hear from the patients, uh, well, to hear from the, 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 uh, the, the, the people that we questioned. So, and this is just a little tiny snapshot, um, but the cancer patients, the question need to be asked the patient right at the start, as opposed to advice being given. They wanna get the input essentially from the patients in the whole process, which was, just, was an important thing for them. Um, and from the oncologist, uh, it was important. Uh, one of the themes was, was research and evaluation um, and how important that would be. And then another theme was just relating to uh, um, how uh, people would be paid, in fact, um, and compensated in a model like this to help support an integrative approach. Um, so moving to implementation. <laughs> um, we looked at creating uh, what we consider to be uh, a good healing environment that um, is warm but still professional and clinical but uh, uh, and is welcoming not hospital related uh, one of the things that uh, the um, the uh, the patients uh, especially were saying was they did not want to see this integrative center in a hospital center or in the cancer ward because they had some associations with that that weren't that didn't feel good so so having this in the community made sense. Um, being multidisciplinary was important um, and having credentialed uh, practitioners that have experience in cancer care was important uh, with clearly defined roles and scopes of practice. Um, also uh, a component of this was that it's to be non-hierarchical so there wasn't such a structure around how uh, um, you know, one the, the physician is the top, and 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 everything else responds and and to that, but that is more of a collaborative effort around patient-centered care. But the patient is truly a focus, and that there is communication between the practitioners, uh, so that there is uh, either open access for patient files and shared uh, electronic records. And we've adopted that process, and it's it's worked quite well. Um, other things were that um, this was to be individualized care, obviously to the person, not a cookie cutter approach that, you know, standardization is good, but uh, we want to focus on that person and that there should be some free care uh, as well and for those that could not afford it. And so we've adopted a subsidized care model where people can apply for that and uh, receive a proportion of their costs are covered and the, the foundation is driving that more now. The um, the goal for integration with local hospitals was really important, both to give educational opportunities for the hospitals and also to have access to the electronic health records. And um, it wasn't the case initially, but I think three years into uh, running uh, the center, we were able to get access to uh, the hospital records. So 
Um, when I'm seeing a patient, I can look on their records and I see the most recent lab results, their imaging uh, results, so I can know where they are in, the, in terms of their progression through the disease and how they're responding. Uh, and that's very, very helpful. And we have a communication process back through consults to the patients, physicians as well. One other part was that we were to identify and have a care coordinator, a central point of contact for the patient that could be responsible, that would be responsible for managing their care to some degree. Um, and we've done that. And then also to have an active and collaborative research program. So this is a just a, a little schematic to show how patients come to the center. Typically they're referred, um, well not referred, they don't require referral, but they can come, they hear about this from the website or from family members or from another practitioner of the community or at the hospital. They book in, they see a care coordinator. Um, if they're eligible for research, they'll be given consent for some of the research studies that we have ongoing. Uh, and then they'll be referred typically in triage to different types of care, whether it's individual therapies or it's a, a program of care. And, and, and often they're using multiple services in that way. So we do have a number of different individual consultative type services. We have three naturopathic doctors. Uh, we have um, one medical doctor, um, actually, yeah, and it's two medical doctors. Uh, and three nurses currently. Uh, we've got uh, an acupuncturist and an assistant, and we have massage therapy, physiotherapy, reflexology, and then we have what we consider mind-body medicine, include incorporating uh, hypnotherapy, uh, something called conscious living coaching and yoga therapy. And then we have a psychiatrist, um, a psychotherapist, and uh, a cognitive behavioral therapist as well. So it's sort of a variety of different types of therapies, all sort of geared to, at addressing the needs of different patients based on how they present. Uh, we have programs uh, that are focused, in one case, our Head Start programs focused on women who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, we have uh, we've had done an anti-cancer lifestyle program, actually we've stopped running this one, um, but uh, that um, was, we found that a bit long in fact, um, and hard for the patients to adhere to. And then we've got weekly workshops uh, that um, we provide for our patients uh, as well to help support them in making some of the changes, especially in nutrition or in uh, activity and fitness. So our patients, um, the, the time when people come to see us, often, uh, very infrequently, do they see us before they get the diagnosis. People are not really uh, motivated until they are they have a diagnosis of cancer. I think it's no surprise. We would like to see more primary prevention, but uh, uh, it's a small proportion of our patients. Um, we're seeing more and more come to us right at diagnosis now. They have some understanding of what we are doing and they want to incorporate an integrative approach right at the beginning. And so we have that um, and growing. Uh, then there's those that are in conventional therapy, usually with uh, chemotherapy or radiation or soon after surgery. Um, we see a lot of these patients. And then we see another large group right after they've been sort of discharged, if you will, from the hospital. And they are without the same kind of follow-up that they would normally have. So they are motivated at this point to do what they can. And then we see about 20% that are, are really seeing us as a last resort. Um, and uh, they have no other options. They want to uh, you know, do anything possible. And those are difficult cases, as you can imagine. Um, we see about 10% of our cases, less actually, that are truly seeking an alternative to care. Um, and uh, in those cases, we really try to help to give them good information, but um, uh, you know, and we support them as best we can. So people come to us for support and management of their symptoms, to slow their disease progression, to prevent recurrence, uh, to cure their cancer, as a, and sometimes a last resort, and as mentioned, as a complete alternative in cases. We do put ourselves very much as an integrative center. Uh, we won't turn people away, but if they have early stage disease um, and they are have a surgery that could cure them, uh, we don't offer them certain therapies that they might see as viable alternatives. So we really try to help give them the right information so they can adopt an approach that's going to be the most supportive for them. 
and some people come to see us because their uh, their wife or their father or whoever else or told them to come. <laughs> um, so um, we see patients at different stages. Um, first stage, immediately following diagnosis. During uh, second stage, during conventional treatment, and third is sort of after they've been discharged, uh, as mentioned before. Uh, but I've uh, gone into that, and they have, each have their attendant issues that they present with, obviously. So I'm just going to give you a, a small subsection, a uh, cross-section analysis of uh, 1,200 unique patients that we saw um, in a 20-month 20 20 month period uh, to give you a, a better flavor for the kind of types of patients that we have in the States. So a variety of, uh, majority are, are female, uh, and the majority uh, come to us between really 40 years and uh, 70 years of age. We see a few pediatric cases, but um, infrequently. Um, the diagnoses are very broad. We see a lot. Um, the majority are, well, the third is breast cancer. Uh, and then um, you can see all the way down the line, there are the different types. So it's, a, it's a, quite a variety. Um, following, in most cases, sort of the trend of, of, of common cancers. And then interestingly here, in terms of stage, we've got, um, you know, stage three and four are, the, are actually the most common cases that we're seeing. Um, so where it's more, more of a serious situation. The individual services that are seen, uh, people uh, of the 1,200 or almost 1,200, I should say, uh, all, all of them saw one type of service or another, um, a thousand of which uh, used naturopathic medicine. Um, 270 saw the acupuncturist. Uh, only 84, in fact, availed themselves of mental health services. Um, 174 for the mind-body therapies like uh, yoga therapy, hypnotherapy, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, 273 went to see a um, one of the um, massage therapies or physiotherapy, so the physical therapies. And then we had 340 that saw one of the medical doctors. And then only 84 actually had uh, an offering of intravenous therapy, which is what we offer to uh, in, in, in certain cases. And then you can see the frequency of the visits. So the average um, visit number per, per patient was three for the naturopathic doctors, whereas it was 13.7 for the acupuncturist. So you can see the, the, the variation in the frequency of visits based on that. 12.1 um, visits for mental health, which is interesting, quite a high proportion. Not such a high number of patients, but those that are using it are using it intensively. Uh, and you can see the difference. IV therapy, the highest frequency, they come for quite a, an intensive period if they're using that. Um, so that just gives a sense of, of some of the patients that we see and, and the, 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 the scope of practice that they're receiving. So our research program uh, really um, consists of three parts. We uh, look at uh, re synthesis research, which is exploring um, in, uh, research that's already been published and trying to bring that information together in a way that is digestible and readable by our patients and also um, is well cited and reference for uh, physicians that want to look at the evidence more closely. And we've done quite a few of those. We're expanding on that. The um, observational research I'll talk briefly about, um, which is just looking at what people are receiving in the community. And then we have a few clinical trials that we have ongoing, one of which I'll speak to a little bit more. Uh, so this is just a poster on some of the knowledge synthesis that we do and we generate patient and professional monographs. Those are all available at our website. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more work to do on that, but um, it's important. The Cusio study, which is the observational study that I'll describe, is um, it's a study that's in collaboration with um, uh, Bastyr University in the United States. And um, we are looking at uh, essentially following uh, and measuring survival for advanced stage breast cancer, colorectal, ovarian, pancreatic cancer patients who receive um, advanced integrative oncology treatments. And um, these are, are uh, treatments that are recommended by naturopathic oncologists in the community in, in these different clinics um, for these patients. And we're also doing a sub-study related to their quality of life. Uh, and we've added another sub-study related to cost, effective, uh, cost impact of the care. 
now there's lots of um, issues, of course, related to uh, um, biases being an observational study. Um, but what we want to do is to document the types of uh, interventions that are being recommended to these patients, publish that information, and um, uh, and then look at what are the what is the what is the trajectory for survival for this group, and then compare that to registry-based data and other clinical trial data. So these are the different clinics that are enrolling uh, patients across both Canada and the States. Um, our enrollment, um, this is a little bit dated. Uh, I need to bring it up to speed, but we're roughly uh, here. Um, yeah, this is an old slide, but um, we're on track to be a little bit behind, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, we're looking for a goal of 400 patients across the, uh, uh, for the full enrollment. Uh, preliminary findings, uh, a lot in Canada, we've got a um, majority of our patients from British Columbia and then some in Ontario. And then the cancer types that we're looking at are actually pretty close to what we predicted. Breast, pancreatic, uh, colorectal being the most, and then ovarian and pancreatic uh, following. Um, but uh, we'll look forward to publishing that information uh, down the road. Uh, the next study, which is the thoracic poise uh, trial is a pragmatic clinical randomized control trial. Um, it's work that I'm, I'm doing with, uh, well, there's a whole group of us, obviously, but um, my, my, my brother's a thoracic physician, uh, surgeon and physician at the Ottawa Hospital and uh, a researcher as well. And so we are doing this uh, together. It's really a, a, a truly integrated approach, I would say. Um, we've got people in the group that are involving oncology, pharmacy, um, surgery, uh, naturopathic medicine, uh, and uh, dietitians as well. So it's, it's, a, it's an extremely um, uh, collaborative process to develop this trial. The goal of the, the study is really to look at what does integrative care, what can it achieve for patients for, who have thoracic cancers, either lung, gastric, or esophageal cancer, that are eligible for surgery and um, are, um, would be receiving integrative care for a month prior to surgery at least, and then for a year after that. And so we've got a number of stages that we're looking at. The first stage is a feasibility study to see how we can, how this rolls out well. And then the second stage, second and third are expanding it into a, a larger scale uh, randomized control trial. So we've just completed ethics. Um, it's taken a year and a half to uh, develop the intervention and to get it through ethics. Um, it's actually probably longer than that now. Um, and it's a 12 year study, so no results for a long time. <laughs> but it's a pragmatic RCT as mentioned. Um, our hypotheses are that the integrative care will improve health related quality of life uh, reduce adverse events associated with surgery, um, improve certain uh, biological surrogates related to immune function and inflammation, and overall improve survival uh, looking at a five-year time frame. And uh, as mentioned, the patient population are those who are uh, eligible for uh, surgery for th with thoracic cancer. Um, the whole intervention development process was really um, a very, like as mentioned, collaborative process and, and uh, an intensive process that we looked at the evidence uh, for, um, for these different therapies. We looked at the safety of the different therapies uh, to make sure that these would be okay within the context of the trial. How feasible are they? Was there a co what cost was associated? How invasive were they? And could patients comply with these therapies? Uh, it was to be consensus based. So we actually surveyed the naturopathic uh, group um, uh, focus on naturopathic oncology about therapies that they would use for this group. And we had uh, 44 respondents out of a group of 600 uh, or so. And, um, and so we take that information and then we, we, we evolved it and, and discussed it with the group uh, and the team to have a consensus-based approach. And that this also had to be holistic across a number of different goals. Um, so yeah, there's a practice review and evidence review. There is expert opinion. We looked at the interventions. Um, we had a meeting with uh, the entire team and then we excluded interventions with a low ranking according to those different principles. Uh, then we subjected the ones that we had for a full safety review 
and um, reviewed that with dietitians and pharmacists as well in terms of the interactions potential. And, um, and then we looked at some of the side effects and contraindications to manage and monitor this as well. And then out of that, we came with a, a core palette of therapies and then an optional palette. And so that, um, uh, that actually is going to be published uh, hopefully soon. Uh, that, uh, but um, really the domains of care, we're looking at providing care through specific natural health products, things that are there to boost the immune system, uh, to reduce inflammation, uh, to help with um, surgical uh, uh, adverse events. And then we have um, sort of mind-body medicine therapies, we have nutritional approach, and we have physical fitness. So it's, 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 a, it's, a whole, it's, it's quite a large group of therapies that are going to be given to this group, but, um, but we're standardizing it so that everyone is going to be receiving the same thing. And um, we won't know what is contributing what effect, but really it's proof of principle to see if we can have an effect on long-term outcomes for these patients through this integrative approach. Um, so, uh, yeah, and there may be more questions on that. Happy to take those, uh, lessons learned, I guess, just in terms of this, uh, there's been, um, challenges with integration both internally in the clinic and externally and trying to implement a model of care that everyone actually can buy into and supports ongoing. Uh, there's the usual physical software infrastructure needs. Funding this, uh, has been a challenge in many ways. Um, but uh, I think we're at a place now that we are secure um, and getting the right team in place is essential for uh, a multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, we've had lots of resources, uh, not least of which are the patients and their, and their families, uh, foundational funding, uh, the practitioners, the research and aligned organizations and also community leaders that have really uh, taken this uh, initiative uh, to task and, and have really contributed. Uh, the importance of collaboration and integration has been essential, both internally amongst the practitioners. Everyone needs to be on the same page. We want to have consistency. We want to make sure that we've been meeting patient needs, that there is effective follow-up for the patients, which is a challenge. Um, and that same thing from a research standpoint that I was there. And then collaboration externally with the hospital and the physicians and other practitioners has been important to get access to uh, hospital files um, and we've been helping through that with the consultation notes and referrals uh, have supported that and really uh, a lot of outreach and education uh, has been essential as well. Uh, barriers that I would say internally uh, to uh, this whole process would be people who have a certain high um, ego needs and um, so trying to find people that can work together in a team is really important. Uh, solo practitioners that um, are used to doing things their way, not, 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 doesn't usually fit. Um, putting the patient first um, and having, if there is a sense of hierarchy, that's a barrier. Um, so we can, we can always elevate the patient to be the, the top of the heap, if you will, and that everyone can usually get behind pretty well. Uh, the communication and cooperation is essential. Uh, and um, resistance to change as well, because we have gone through lots of evolution in this whole process. Uh, and there's a, a lot of time needed to collaborate and to communicate and to, uh, to share what we're trying to, uh, to do. Facilitators, a care coordinator has been a facilitator. Shared patient files has been helpful. Um, and uh, professional, interprofessional communications has been uh, very helpful uh, in terms of, and just having uh, informal meetings, lots of time for discussion is being essential. Uh, external barriers, resistance to change, typically uh, certain biases that exist within uh, the conventional system, uh, physicians that are trained not uh, without any exposure to complementary medicine or, you know, perhaps with a few uh, thought leaders that are very resistant and believe that anything alternative is quackery, is, uh, you know, uh, we still encounter that, unfortunately, but um, it's uh, diminishing. Uh, patients' lack of self-perception of power is one of the things that is a barrier that are that just want to be told what to do. Uh, so we're trying to empower patients, I think, helps them, but not everyone is, is actually um, open to that in a way. 
Um, there is still, a, a, we need more evidence. Uh, so having more evidence allows more ease of adoption. And the cost of care is certainly a barrier. And uh, um, the fact that it's not covered by the uh, government services here is a limitation. Some of the facilitators in externally in the community have been uh, champions in the hospital. We've had some oncologists that are very supportive of this uh, and um, leaders in the community as well that have helped uh, in the media. Um, education outreach mentioned can't do enough of that. Having one-on-one -on -one communication with different clinicians has been really, really helpful. Once they understand that what we're trying to achieve, we're not trying to get in the way of their care, we're trying to uh, support their patients as well, um, then, you know, that it, it, it invariably uh, leads to uh, much greater openness. Partnerships, uh, we have a not-for-profit status, which uh, helps a lot. Um, uh, the research that we're doing and also patients are essential. So I think uh, I won't belabor this, but <laughs> lessons learned, relationships are great. Uh, ability to evolve and adapt have been important, uh, supporting others, uh, being open and transparent, um, being, uh, being proud and strong in, in what integrative medicine can achieve uh, and not apologizing for it, um, having a persistent positive outlook, and um, research has been fantastic in, in this whole process, finding our local champions and uh, communication and collaboration. So uh, with that, I think that brings me to the end. Um, here's a loon from Canada. And uh, um, so uh, uh, thank you. I don't know if there's any um, questions or comments. Uh, Dogo? Yes? Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Oh, that's good. So my name is Sam. I'm from uh, Santa Casa de Passos, OK? It's from Brazil. Uh, we have a question. Would you like to know about what do you think about the resistance of the uh, conventional doctors to change to uh, naturopathy? Can you see the this resistance? Yes. And the, how the, can you manage? Just, and how can you manage that? Um, so uh, yes, there is resistance. Uh, I would say that. It um, really depends on, on which uh, physician that we're dealing with. Some, some of the oncologists and the physicians are quite open and supportive of their patients adopting um, an approach that we provide as long as they're, they're well informed. Uh, I think that, uh, um, that so yes, there, there's a group that's quite supportive. There are some that I would say are on the fence um, and that uh, don't, uh, aren't, aren't supportive, but they don't dismiss it either. And uh, they just sort of don't have anything to say about it usually. Um, and, uh, and then there's a group that are sort of actively pushing their patients to not do any, anything um, considered alternative or complementary in the community. The, um, so we always recommend that patients are fully disclose their uh, care that they're receiving. And uh, we try to, um, if there is resistance, we try to engage with the oncologist as much as we can to give them some evidence for what it is that we're doing and why and, um, and open that discussion. And that's helped in many, many cases. Um, everyone's busy, so it's a challenge to find that time to be able to do so, but uh, that's there. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the challenge is that in complementary, like this is the whole thing of seeing this umbrella of CAM is this big, broad thing, because there's stuff that happens in the community that I feel very bad about. Like I, I wouldn't want my patients to do. They come to me with certain ideas and I'm like, no, that's crazy, you know? Um, I won't say it like that, but um, so I'm, I consider myself quite a skeptic. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, I think if we can, if we can inform the pay or have them be good consumers of information so that they can evaluate what are the costs, what's the reason for doing this therapy, uh, what are the possible side effects, um, 
is there any interactions with their chemotherapy or radiation? So they have to be able to ask good questions and not just accept everything blindly. And um, so, you know, there is resistance and, and, and I think in some cases it's rightly applied. Um, I, I think for naturopathic medicine in Canada, in the States at least, there are good regulations around naturopathic medicine. The education is quite rigorous. It's a four-year full-time uh, postgraduate program. Uh, there's accreditation, you know, so that doesn't mean you're always, you're not going to, you're going to get always good care, but uh, you at least have certain way of knowing that. But then there's other people that don't have any credentials and are practicing alternative medicine. Um, and that can be problematic. So it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, I don't know if that really answers your question, but the process. Okay. Okay. So once again, I'd like to, to thank you very much for your uh, speech, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.